Right, Ed. Well, this all looks very simple and mechanical and nothing to it, really. But many people think this is one of the most important developments in human history. One person called it the gunpowder of the mind, which is a nice description of printing. Mm. Another person said, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, the, the great uh, scientist, said that there were three inventions which had changed the modern world, the compass, gunpowder, and printing. So that's one of the three greatest inventions of humanity. And then a third person, the great Babbage, who invented the computer, said that the modern world commences with the printing press. So you've got people who really think this has changed everything. That what we are now, today, is the result of, very largely the result of this. It's difficult to think of it now because we're moving into a, a new age of uh, computing and so on. We're beginning to forget the printing revolution and the era that it inaugurated. But I wondered if you had any ideas about what is so important about printing. I mean, what, what would you guess were the consequences of, of printing? Well, I suppose one of the most important would be from the printing going from the elite to the, the masses, uh, to the populace, uh, either for educational purposes or just simply enjoyment. Um, and we've seen that over the past, uh, even from the 60s, the, the, the mass production of magazines mm -hmm. uh, and comics. Because mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was a small lad, we had very limited uh, amounts of comics um, to choose from. Yes. Whereas nowadays we can go into any it's of the, the large... Either the or the dandy. The dandy, <laughs> yes, one of my favourite ones. Yeah. Uh, whereas nowadays we can go into, into any newsagent and uh, find masses of, of books Mm. Uh, magazines and all the comics. But that's quite recent. Uh, the, the revolution that they thought occurred, which is the beginning of movable printing in the West in the middle of the 15th century, about 1450, that sort of time with Gutenberg. I mean, that's before too many uh, comics and so on occurred. So mm. one has to think of some of the wider things. I, I think democratization of knowledge, was, which is what you're talking about, mm. making everyone equal equal access to information obviously is one of the great revolutions. Um, but it goes back, obviously, even back beyond our childhoods, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, were there any other things that you thought might have been the result or an effect of printing? Well, the movement of knowledge throughout the, you know, different countries, uh, you know, from Gutenberg, and of course you've got Caxon coming to, to England, mm -hmm. uh, and of course movable type, mm -hmm. which of course increased the, the speed. And although mm -hmm. it is relatively slow in, in comparison with today's computers, mm -hmm. then of course at that time uh, it was expanding uh, mm -hmm. knowledge quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've got, as usual, some theories to tre test out on you. Can, mm -hmm. I, can I try them out and see yeah, sure. what you think? One great theory about the effects of printing is um, that it issued in the day of the nation state. That our concept of ourselves as nations, as peoples, we the English, we the Scots, we the Welsh, we the French, and so on, is very much related to movable print after Gutenberg. Mm -hmm. it, it created a universal kind of language. Often the printing was now in the local languages, the dialects rather than in Latin. So you could begin to get an idea of we speak this language, we have a literature of our own like that. So one man has invented the term print capitalism, and he, by that he means the two things that created modern nationalism, and stress the difference between us and them who speak mm. and print another language. Have you come across this? No, but I can see where you're getting it, and of course Robbie Burns mm, springs exactly, to mind. Exactly. Uh, where of course we can now buy his poems and mm. read it mm. uh, in, the, in the, the tongue, the native tongue. That's right. Uh, we've got the Doric language up in Aberdeen. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can see what you're meaning. Yeah. So, modern print nationalism leads to the nation state. So that's one effect. A, s a second effect that people have thought is the whole of modern religion. That is the Reformation. Many people think that without the printing press, Luther, for example, and the Protestantism couldn't have taken off because he could have been suppressed. But the moment you get the possibility of sectarians printing different versions of the Bible and so on, and it becoming popular mm. and available, means that you can have great religious differences in Europe. So the Reformation, which obviously is one of the great effects, and Scotland's a good place to think of the, the Reformation, 
uh, was one of the effects of printing. Do mm -hmm. you think that sounds plausible? Yes, but it c I think it could also work the other way. Uh, and I'm thinking perhaps of newspapers, mm. where in fact they can perhaps bend the truth. And I think if you look at some of the headlines and some of the stories of the First World War, mm. then they certainly are bending the truth of how the troops were doing in France compared with what they were actually doing yes, uh, yes. in France. And so perhaps, again, that is uh, a minus yes. as far as uh, mass communication is concerned, if you want it to, to do that. So if you took the old saying and changed it, lies, damn lies, and printing. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, certainly. And th in fact, this uh, was what the, the Catholic Church thought. They thought the heresies were bending the truth and inventing new things. Obviously, the Calvinists thought it, that was the truth and the Catholics. But it began t you began to get disputes about what the truth is. And it also created a religion in which you had direct access to God. It was as if you had a telephone directly to God, before you had to listen to the priests, because mm -hmm. you couldn't read about it. Protestantism, as you know, emphasizes the Bible enormously, and it was one of the great spurs to printing, the, the need for Bibles. But it worked both way around. Once you had the Bible, then everyone thought, I have the truth inside me. All I need to do is to look at this book. Mm -hmm. Before that, you had to go and ask someone. Of course, they gave you a standard version if they were a priest. Mm -hmm. So that religious dimension, I think, is, is terribly important. The third theory that's been put forward is economic effects of printing. Now, um, I know that you're a fine craftsman, the people who work here are fine craftsmen. The effects of movable metal printing on craftsmanship, the, the very intricate work you have to do to get the metal um, type right and to set it exactly even and to make the presses that will press it, all that was, in, in the early days, very important for the development of skilled craftsmanship, which led later on into the Industrial Revolution. So that's one obvious effect of the economics. A second is the, the curious idea that you can have interchangeable parts. This is terribly important later on in industrial developments, that you make exactly standard parts. You take one out and you put another one in, and it's exactly the same and obviously modern consumer electronics and so on, depend on interchangeable parts. That idea comes very strongly from printing, which is one of the first applications of this. I don't know whether you'd thought of that in relation to... No, I hadn't. Uh, I hadn't uh, with the, the future, no. Mm. Uh, what I did think about was the, the splitting of skills, where the printer, more or less at one time, did the complete job. Mm. Um, and from that, because of the uh, the importance and the urgency, uh, perhaps more urgency, in the work, that in fact the skills were split. So of course you had the paper maker, the ink maker, the mm. compositor, mm. printer, plate maker, and so on. So we end up with about seven different crafts, and every one important, and yet we fit it together mm. like a cog, because one cannot do without the other. That's, that's very interesting. That's obviously terribly important, and we're quite close to where Adam Smith developed his famous theories about the division of labor, how you made things and you divided up the thing and made it efficiently. So this is another good, exam good mm. example of that. Yes. Another um, economic effect is obviously the fact that you can apply energy to printing, non-human energy. In many kinds of printing, which are just taking a block, a, a wood block or something, and then printing, you can do it by hand. Anyone can just do it. The moment you have this kind of printing, it, a lot of it comes to do with the press, the pressing down hard, and that was Gutenberg's great discovery, having watched wine presses, he got the idea of you could press. And very early on, although you can use hand presses, um, it's a lot of work and hard, and you don't always get it absolutely flat. So people were very soon thinking, how can we use mechanical force to press? like this. And I gather this printing works, for example, used water power for that's printing. That's right. Um, it used water power right up until 1930, mm. which again must be unique, because I only know one other press mm. that ever used water power. And again, this must have been local knowledge, because mm. of course you're in the borders, and of course the borders are famous, or was famous, for its mills, mm. and there was lots of mills using the actual laid mm. uh, and water power. And of course it would have been environmentally friendly today. Mm as it was mm. yesteryear, uh, in the leaf in here, something like five silk mills, mm. uh, a sawmill, an engine, 
and a printer all washing off the same head of water, mm -hmm. off the same lathe. So that must be a bit of a record, I would think. Yes, it is, and it shows that this is a mill. But the fascinating thing which you realize is that most produce physical goods, bits of clothing or this is the only kind of mill in the world that produces knowledge. Mm -hmm. Very early on, what it produces was identical pieces of knowledge, knowledge goods. So in a sense, the printing works were the first factories producing identical goods, but they weren't bits of clothing, they were books or ideas. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you could multiply and generate hundreds of copies of it, an identical thing, later went on into the cotton factories and so on, must have been influenced by printing works. I don't know if you'd thought of that. Well, again, I can relate it back to Smales because, of course, what you're saying is more or less the same type of work that Smale did. Mm. Uh, the work for the, the, uh, for the mills in this area. Uh, not only that, I can apply that to perhaps the newspaper that he did, an al albeit quite small newspaper, he generated something like 700 copies for the mm. small town. Mm. And of course, that would be the communication mm. that the town would have had mm. uh, for outside information. Mm. And identical pieces. Everyone's newspaper Everyone's was the, the same. same. That's right. <laughs> Which was a strange idea in the old yeah. world because handcrafted things were normally different. So basically, you're beginning to get a me mechanized reproduction of thousands of identical objects using machines, using power. And so you can see how all this very easily shifts sideways into other industries and manufacturers in this area. The most difficult thing and um, I find to understand is the psychological and the mental effects of printing. And there's been a lot of theorizing about it. One theory is that it completely changed reading habits, that before on parchment you had a few people reading. You now have a mass public who are trained in a new visual art, which is basically to read in our languages, our Western languages, along the page from left to right, from top to bottom. And some people have argued that this has given us a new linear perspective on truth, that we tend to think of ideas as running along in lines, rather like the printing press. And this has changed before we perhaps perceive things all as at once, like that, as a picture. But now you begin to have inside your brain that truth comes along in lines, like a printing press. Mm. Did you come across that? No, I think this is getting a little <laughs> bit <laughs> philosophic. Well, it's, uh, it, it's both philosophic and also the most interesting, because it's beginning to get into the differences between cultures and mm -hmm. so on. And another philosophic idea um, that, that, that comes out of it is that it, it changed the attitude to yourself. Before you interacted with other people, you heard the news from other people. Everything was oral, spoken, and so on. The printing press gives you a book, and you become an individual, closed in the private space which you're reading like this. So some people think that the, the curious development of Western individualism, where we, I am I, and you are you, and we are very different, and I have my own private mental world, which is private only to me, is somehow related to book reading, this kind. So at some very deep levels, it changed our perceptions of space, time, other people. Our whole mental world was shifted by a technology. So at first, it just looks like bits of metal which you put into a tray and print. But the side effects on politics, economics, religion, and the perception of the individual are vast, a revolution indeed. But <laughs> the problem is, you know, where, if someone said to you, where was movable type printing invented, what would you say? I would say in Mainz. In Mainz, in Mainz, by, by Gutenberg. Well, you, in your own guide to Robert Smale's print works on page five or six, I think it is, it says that it was first invented by Pi Ling or someone like this, a Chinese, Chinese yeah. um, with bits, uh, tiny bits of wooden print in about 100 AD. So 1,350 years earlier, the Chinese, as usual, had invented movable type printing. And certainly, as you know, by about 800, they were printing books. The first book in the British Museum, which is the first one in the world, Chinese book, is about 850. 
So 600 years before Gutenberg, the Chinese were busily printing books, and the Japanese very soon afterwards. So if they had this immense supposed revolution so much earlier, we should have seen all these effects of printing in China and Japan. If you look at China and Japan, it had absolutely no effect. Well, I'm sure it had small effects and quite large effects, but it didn't have these dynamic dynamite-like effects it didn't lead to the development of nation states. It didn't de lead to the development of the Reformation or heretical sects. It didn't lead to factories and industrialization. It didn't lead to the development of the individual. So there's a great puzzle. It's clearly not just printing in itself. It's printing within a context, mm -hmm. which comes in like all technologies, and then it's used. And the, the usual theory, um, well, I'll give you a chance. Can you hear any theories about why it should have such a different effect in different cultures? Was it to do again with the masses? With the, the, the small, elite. small, the elite uh, holding on to this uh, and not allowing it to flow down to the masses? And, and if we think about China, China mm -hmm. you know, it's a very large continent, uh, millions of people, uh, but in a way, peasants. Uh, even to this day. Mm. Uh, and so therefore, perhaps it's, as I say, the elite holding on to knowledge and not letting it filter through. Absolutely. Well, that's certainly one of the things. Though, surprisingly, the literacy rates, certainly by the 16th, 17th century, were very high in Japan. So they, they let it flow about in Japan, and to a certain extent in China, as long as you went up through the Confucian educational system, near the top, everyone could have access. So that is one of the things, it's the distribution of the printed book. Um, another, but the, I think the main reasons are that printing is a tool, like any other tool or extension of our mind, and therefore you, the tool will be used in each society or civilization in a certain way. Once you bring a tool like this into a civilization which is already, say, religiously split, mm. you're already getting sects and heresies in Europe, and the moment you get printing, they can flower and you can have the Reformation. China and Japan, you'd, you'd l completely dampen down any possibility of sects and heresies. So there was no religious division to make, be made larger by printing. And the same with the nation state. Europe was already divided into lots of little linguistic and cultural nations. And then printing just inflamed this and made it much stronger. But in China and Japan, it, printing was actually used to reinforce the center, and as you say, it was just kept near the top, and they, cru they used it as a crushing ideological device. It was their way of making everyone the same mm -hmm. and not allowing them to be different. As you know, printing in the West, for instance, when it developed in Germany, but it was banned in Germany very early on. It was developed to a certain extent a little bit in Islamic societies, but banned in Islam as dangerous, perhaps subversive. And it was controlled heavily in Japan and China, but only where there were already nation states could it be used divisively like that. So there were those sorts of difference already there. There's another difference which is more technical, and I'd like your advice on. And that is the difference between the actual type of printing. We talk about printing in China and Japan, but we've used the same word for what are two basically different systems. And I've been thinking about this recently, and they really are, shouldn't be called printing. Mm -hmm. One, this is movable type printing with metal type. We could reserve the word printing for that. We'd have to invent a new word for what China and Japan does, because what they basically do is draw pictures on wood and then stamp them. They're basically using stamp. You might call it stamping rather than printing. Um, or the sort of thing you do when you seal a document. You might call it sealing. It's the same principle. They just have a piece of wood and they engrave their characters on it and they do that. Now that kind of stamping had been widespread in Europe long before mm -hmm. Gutenberg, as you know. Mm -hmm. It was used for playing cards and religious Im symbols for hundreds of years before Gutenberg. And that sort of thing has one kind of effect. We just stamp like that. This kind of movable print has an entirely different effect. This allows a different relationship to truth, because with this you can keep modifying it, tweaking it, adding, mm -hmm. putting in a knot when it, there wasn't a knot before. Mm -hmm. Saying, I mean, the difference between saying 
the sun goes around the earth and the earth goes around the sun, which is just changing one line in one book, is the whole of modern civilization in many ways and our new views of astronomy. And it just requires a printer to take out the print and put it in a different order, and there you are. Now, with woodblock printing, you have a whole thing and you make it in one block and then you do that. And I think the psychological, the technical effects, you don't need water power for that, for instance, you just plonk it down. So the industrial effects, the psychological effects, and all the others, I think, are different with these two technologies, which on the surface look as if they're the same because they're transmitting information using a stamping device, but it's subtly different. Now, if that's the difference, or one of the big differences, you then get into the question of why China and Japan didn't develop movable type printing. I mean, as I said, they discovered it 100 AD. Mm -hmm. They introduced some movable type early on. The, the Japanese are an interesting case because they saw the Jesuits use a movable type at the end of the 16th century, and for 20 years they used mo movable type. And then they gave it up. They saw the Koreans using movable type. They got all the movable type from Korea, seized it in one of their expeditions, gave it up. The Chinese fiddled with it, gave it up. No one was interested in this kind of stuff. I mean, it's a waste of time. So you ask yourself, why mm -hmm. was it a waste of time? Have well, you I, would, I would guess language. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Perhaps, perhaps the alphabet. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Uh, whereas we've only got, well, we had 24, and now we've got 26 letters of the alphabet. I assume the, the Japanese have got a few, few letters more. How, do you know how many more? Oh, uh, quite a few. Uh, I would what like would to you guess? Probably a few hundred. Well, if I said to you that in order to type um, or to set a newspaper, which they did, say, at the end of the 19th century, with movable type in Japan, the basic number of characters you need is 6,100. Yeah. And you need also your local um, katakana, uh, hiragana script, which is a couple of hundred. You've got three different alphabets, I mean not alphabets, two syllabaries, you know, like the alphabet, and one pictographic language with three 6,100 characters. So let's say six and a half thousand. And you want three sizes, three font sizes. So you want 18, say 20,000 characters. Then, if you're really ambitious, in the Chinese language, there are 80,000 characters. So you've got another 75,000 odd, which you can't do. I mean, you can't keep them. So whenever you come one across one of them, you draw them in yeah. a bit of wood and you plonk it in. But even with 18, 20,000, I mean, imagine someone going around trying to find the right piece out of 20,000 